Would you pay more than full price for something that's broken? If not, or if that seems like a silly question, then how do you explain that as a country, we're paying for what might be the most expensive and the worst performing maternity care in the developed world? In order to answer this question, I would like to share three things with you. How we know that our birth care system is broken, why it's broken, and how together we could unbreak it. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, isn't our birth care system the best in the world? It's not. We have broken birth. And we can either let this situation persist or we can turn things around. We can provide better care for the mothers and children in our lives and those still to come. And it doesn't require more money, more technology, or more infrastructure. My name is Ryan. I'm a parent, a biophysicist, and a research professor at Georgetown University. Years ago, when I first started studying medical ethics, a woman confided in me about her experience giving birth in a well-known hospital. It was like being helpless and being raped, she said. I was shocked, utterly stunned, and I've been thinking about it ever since. I had to ask myself, what's the point in having a society if we don't protect and empower people at their most vulnerable moments? I've been studying maternity care for over a decade now, and I'd like to share with you some of what I've learned. For me, at least, early on, I was introduced to pregnancy and childbirth, mostly in sensationalized TV shows and in a pretty mind-numbingly dry introduction in seventh grade health class. Was anyone else's experience kind of like that? Okay, I, hear, I hear some yeses, I think. I don't think we talk about birth reasonably often enough. It's as though there's some sort of cloud of taboo about it that makes us feel like it's inappropriate to talk about with people unless they've been through the experience or are about to go through the experience. But giving birth and how you're born are very important. How you're born affects the rest of your life and can affect the rest of your mother's life too. Birth is an amazing event. It deserves respect. It deserves to be thought about, talked about in depth, wondered at. There are real risks, and there are a host of values at play beyond safety. And safety is important. It's worth paying money for. But we are trying to buy safety from a system that's broken birth. Look at this. This graph depicts international statistical data on maternal mortality rates. Each little bubble represents a country, and I've had room to put names on a few of them, but not all of them. The vertical axis is the maternal death rate per 100,000 live births, and the horizontal axis is the healthcare spending per capita in international dollars. Would you have guessed that back in 1995, the US would be this outlier on the far right-hand side of the graph, spending the most per capita of any country in the world on healthcare, and yet at the same time with mothers dying more often than at least 30 other countries. Now watch as time goes forward. Maternal mortality seems to be decreasing everywhere, except in the United States, where it has increased consistently year after year from 1995 until 2010, the last year in this Gapminder statistics set. So now, we're doing worse than 45 other countries, and we're not talking just about wealthy countries. And as of 2011, our infant mortality rate is worse than 50 other countries. We also suffer from terrible health disparities, for example, the infant mortality rate is between one and a half and three times higher for people of African American and indigenous heritage. And as you'll see, death is not our only bad outcome. So what are we doing wrong? Well, I want to tell you about my friend Donna. When I first met Donna, she was a bright young college student. She had long, dark hair and engaging brown eyes, and she charmed me with her intelligence, her passion for philosophy, and the fact that she fluently spoke five languages. Donna went to law school. She's, she met her husband there. She graduated with a stellar record, practiced law, and became the head of legal at a powerful commodities trading company. In other words, she was a woman in a very strong position. When Donna was 29 years old, 
she went to a New York hospital to give birth to her first child. This experience left her scarred, shaken, and forever changed. Donna had gone to the hospital that day because she was three days past her due date, and her obstetrician had told her that if she didn't deliver soon, her baby might die. No one had told Donna just how uncertain due dates are. What you're seeing here are the spontaneous delivery dates of 865 women, all with clock-like 28-day menstrual cycles for the year prior to delivering their babies, calculated with the date from conception calculated two different ways, once by ultrasound and once by last menstrual period. What I ask you to notice is just how wide these curves are and how different the curves are, but they both represent the same population of women. So what this leads me to conclude is that a healthy due date cannot at all be ascribed to a single day or even a week. It's a very wide window. Every pregnancy is different. Growing a baby inside you is not at all like clockwork. But Donna didn't know this. She accepted the Pitocin induction that her OB ordered. No one told her to ask about her Bishop score, which tells you the likelihood of successful induction. No one told her that an induction would be painful and could put her baby in extreme distress. So four hours later, her OB told Donna that her baby had developed a non-reassuring heart rate and that she needed to perform an emergency C-section or her child might die or be brain damaged. Once in the operating room, Donna began to question whether or not a cesarean was really necessary or an emergency because no one seemed to be in a hurry. But when she looked to her husband for help, he said, I know it's your body, but I want a normal baby, even if that means you have a cesarean. So step by step, Donna had come to feel entirely alone. And this is what moves me. Shouldn't our mothers feel supported, protected, safe? Donna is one of the 15 million women represented on this graph of cesarean rate by year in the United States, which has risen to almost one third of all births. The World Health Organization used to estimate that the optimal rate of cesareans was somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Some literature estimates it to be lower. While at some point we may have a better picture, it's clear to me that our cesarean rate in this country is far, far too high. And a cesarean is major surgery as Donna found out. For her, intense pain lasted for weeks, and the birth experience left a rift in her marriage. Soon, Donna went from feeling like a victim to having righteous indignation, identifying herself as a survivor of an unwanted and unneeded surgery that resulted from interventions she neither needed nor was explained the consequences of. And evidence supports her. For example, in this survey of 750 first-time mothers delivering at term, either epidural or induction alone quadrupled the rate of C-section, while both together multiplied it by a factor of six. And you might expect that a cesarean subjects or exposes the mother to the usual sorts of surgical risks, such as pain, long recovery time, hemorrhage, infection, reaction to the anesthetic, or organ injury. And you'd be right, and also, a previous cesarean is one of the strongest predictors of maternal morbidity or significant negative outcomes of a birth, with a vaginal birth after cesarean being slightly less risky for women than a repeat cesarean in most cases. But the hidden group injured by cesareans is actually the children who are delivered by them. A cesarean birth is associated with a 20% increased risk of asthma, an 80% increased risk of juvenile obesity, and possibly respiratory and digestive allergies. And this is all for the child, because the moment of birth is the crucial first opportunity to be inoculated by the healthy bacteria that we all depend on. And as you might guess, the bacteria you get exposed to in a hospital is not nearly as healthy as the bacteria you're naturally exposed to as you pass through your mother's vagina. Now, I've heard physicians argue that our high cesarean rates are due to problems with our mothers. For example, that today's mothers are getting fatter 
and that their babies are heavier. Now, leaving behind the way that that position uh, feels to me offensive, I want to look at the data. So it turns out that compared with 1990, the rate of high, high weight births has actually decreased by 10%, probably in part due to our, our excessive tendency to induce. And it's never been shown in the medical literature that heavier mothers are better off with cesareans. So now that we've seen some of the evidence that our birth system is broken, I would like to share four real reasons with you that do not involve blaming mothers why our birth care system is broken. First, in, Medca in Medscape's 2011 report, they found that the average, that obstetricians on average see between 50 and 125 clients per week, and prenatal visits last fewer than 15 minutes. So let's imagine ourselves an obese who sees 100 patients a week for 10 minutes apiece every week. Can you imagine trying to build a trusting relationship with that many people in that amount of time? And to come from the other point of view, can you imagine the frustration those women might feel trying to build a trusting relationship with their physician in that amount of time? And I want to point out that this is a very intimate event that we're leading up to. And these are the opportunities for crucial prenatal counseling to occur. So what comes to my mind is the sort of disclaimer that you hear at the end of an infomercial. Do not drink or smoke while pregnant. Remember to eat well, exercise, and to take your vitamins. Call your physician if any of the following occur. High blood pressure, low blood pressure, dizziness, depression, weight gain of more than two pounds in a week, shoulder pain, changes in vision, or if your baby delivers on its own. <laughs> so, at the same time, interventions have become so routine in the hospital that I would argue that attention in the hospital setting has become focused on preparing for and applying them rather than on attending to and noticing what that mother and baby in particular need. Interventions begin subtly as soon as you arrive at the hospital. This is a incomplete list of interventions that are overperformed or in some cases like circumcision and infant gender assignment surgery are entirely against the patient's medical best interest. And interventions are not benign. Every intervention exposes the mom and baby to increased risks and the chance of additional complications. So right when she checks into a hospital, a mom may be told not to eat or drink, even though being hungry alone can slow and complicate labor. I mean, this is an athletic activity we're headed up to. So can you imagine preparing for a marathon and your coach telling you, please do not eat or drink the day before you run your marathon? She'll probably then be given an IV, and her movement will be restricted, which also makes labor more painful and can increase the chance of complications. She may be given a belt to wear, an electronic fetal monitor, and may be encouraged or told to labor on her back, which angles the birth canal uphill, reduces crucial circulation to the uterus, and can increase the chance of complications and pain also. Well over 40% of moms in the US are currently induced, many or most unnecessarily, like my friend Donna, which increases pain, the chance of uterine rupture, and escalation to a C-section. Oh, and fetal distress, as we heard earlier. And a falling but significant number of mothers are still receiving episiotomies, a universally unnecessary incision into the vagina that can increase the risk of severe vaginal tearing, incontinence, sexual complications. Okay, and you've seen our C-section data. And did you know, by the way, that obstetrics is a surgical specialty? So I would argue that by training, we've essentially set obstetricians up to operate this way. I mean, can you imagine if we told architects only how to build with steel and concrete? What would our homes look like? And maybe that would be fine if there were good, consistent evidence that this kind of treatment improves birth. So the next question is, is there? This is the American Congress, they've changed their name to Congress recently. This is the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists' own internal review of the evidence basis of their practice guidelines. They divided their guidelines into three levels of quality of evidence. Level A were those guidelines based on good and consistent scientific evidence and accounted for one quarter 
of obstetric guidelines. Category, uh, excuse me, level B were those guidelines based on limited or inconsistent evidence and account for about 40% of obstetric guidelines. And level C, those guidelines based essentially on opinion accounted for 35% of obstetric guidelines. They then break these guidelines down by topic. In particular, please focus on the far right. Notice that of mode of delivery guidelines, about 5% of them are based on good and consistent scientific evidence. But those are the guidelines that say whether or not you should receive a C-section or a mechanical delivery, for example, like forceps. So OBs are very expert at performing interventions, but they don't have available to them as much information about when those interventions are needed. And some of those interventions are entirely counter to the evidence. For example, for a second example related to the baby, I want to talk to you about cord clamping. Clamping of the cord before the placenta finishes pulsing makes breathing urgent for the child rather than giving it a few moments to start. It deprives the baby of some of their own blood, thus we have actually created an epidemic of anemic newborns in the hospitals. And those two things together can cause further emergencies. And the scientific literature is entirely unanimously against early clamping of the umbilical cord. Okay, hopefully that sounds convincing. So I went to at Georgetown University Hospital. I talked with a neonatologist there. When I asked her if she agreed with my assessment of the literature about cord clamping, she said unambiguously, yes. When I asked her what they do at the hospital, she said, we clamp and cut the cord right away. I said, um, why do you do that? <laughs> and she said, because we want to separate the baby from the mom as quickly as possible. And I said, wait, why do you want to do that? I mean, that's traumatic for an infant. And she said, because different people are responsible for the mother and the baby in the hospital. And what frustrates me about this is that it is representative of my conversations with people in the hospital setting about all kinds of procedures, even when they know that practicing a different way would be better for their clients, they have some reason to practice differently. So that means that there are conflicts of obligation within the hospital, meaning that at times when the hospital's best interest is over here and the patient's best interest would mean you behave this way, the hospital's best interest wins. And I don't think hospitals are doing very well at communicating or disclosing those conflicts of obligation to their clients. So our birth care system is broken for at least four reasons. Number one, there isn't a sufficient amount of space and time to build an adequate relationship between the mother and the caregivers. Number two, our interventions have become routine instead of based on the mom and baby's best interests. Number three, those interventions are often opinion-based. And number four, there are conflicts of obligation within the hospital that systematically cause behavior that's out of alignment with the client, with the mom and baby's best needs. And all this happened I think for a well-intended reason. I think obstetrics has been organized around handling high-risk emergency surgical births. And they may do this well, but treating all births this way actually derails well birth, which is the vast majority of births. So I think we need to keep the good of this system and pair it with another approach that doesn't break well birth. Oh my goodness, you might be saying. How could we possibly find or create highly trained, experienced professionals who have evidence-based practices, who work within a context of a strong relationship with the mother, compassion for newborns, and who don't experience conflicts of, of obligation with a large institution? Well, if you were asking that, I'm glad, because there's an answer. Those practitioners already exist. They are independent midwives. Now, I don't know if I lost anyone at the word midwife, so I want to ask everyone to take a moment to reflect. What's the image in your mind of a midwife? And perhaps more importantly, where did that image come from? So in this next part of the talk, I want to introduce you to three midwives. I want to discuss some of the literature about safety of midwifery care. I want to talk about how and why midwives are key to unbreaking birth in the US. And I'd also like to tell you how Donna's story ends. First, 
Let me introduce you to three midwives. And midwives are experts in normal. There are wide variations of normal. Doctors are, are, are experts in pathology. In modern medicine, we use an elephant gun to kill a mosquito. The more you can work in a holistic way and work with people day by day and teach them as you go. The basis or the, the foundation of health disparities is racism that, you know, like uh, African Americans, Native Americans have sort of this basic truth about how they live their lives in the United States. And so when you're dealing with a community that by definition, communities that by definition have increased stress due to all of these factors, you can't be providing prenatal care that doesn't address those things or attempt to address them. Midwives who are providing care to women of color are having better outcomes. First of all, midwives typically have longer appointments. Um, longer might mean in some settings 20 or 30 minutes as opposed to five or 10. It may mean um, for a home birth or an out of hospital birth midwife, more like 45 minutes, 10 hour. In the course of an appointment that is that long, a woman is just gonna get a feeling like this person actually cares what happens to me. There is a level of concern that goes just beyond the bare physical necessities of providing prenatal care and goes towards her personhood. I cared for a um, a mother who had hearing loss. That caused a speech impediment that made it hard for her to understand because she was from rural Virginia and had a strong Southern accent in addition to hearing loss. And this was her second baby and we requested records. And when the records came, written across the top in the front was mental retardation. And that really, you could tell, drove a lot of the decision-making that happened with her first baby related to induction and in that she wasn't really given much explanation. And things happened in her course of her care where it wasn't even about consent, there just wasn't a conversation. And that was why she sought out midwifery care and home birth for her next baby. So as a human being, I find these narratives very compelling. And I'm also a scientist, which some people would argue is quite different than being a human being. And, and so I'd also like to look at data at the same time. Now midwives can work in homes, in midwife-led birthing centers, and in hospitals, depending on their training paths. So this makes the midwifery scene a little confusing. I would like to focus on home births while we look at the next part, the safety research, in part because I think people will have the most concern or doubt about safety of midwifery-assisted birth at home. So I found 21 studies published between 1995 and 2013 of home birth outcomes in industrialized nations. Planned home birth at full gestational age attended by professional midwives always equaled or outperformed hospital birth. And that's low risk hospital birth that we're comparing with. And I would like to mention the somewhat famous meta-analysis by Wax et al. that was published in 2010 that found that neonatal mortality rate was higher in home births. That is their finding. However, they included unattended births in their analysis. So I would argue that it's unfair and perhaps not very useful to judge midwives by the outcomes of births to which they were not invited. And if you look at the paragraph Wax et al. gives to their sensitivity analysis, you will see that when they remove the unattended births, they say that the different, there's no statistically significant difference in neonatal, in neonatal mortality between home births and low-risk hospital births, which leaves the only differences that they found that were significant between the two groups, particularly maternal morbidity in the forms of severe laceration, hemorrhage and infection, all worse in the hospital. So midwives have lower morbidity and complication rates, I think for many reasons. One of them is that they do not intervene unnecessarily very often. This is from one of those home birth studies that I mentioned. It is a comparison of intervention rates in different settings. The green bars are the, of the rates of that particular intervention among 2,000 home births assisted by a certified professional midwife. The pink bars, where data was available, are the rates of that intervention for low-risk hospital births. And the blue bars are the rates of that intervention for all hospital births lumped together. By the way, the green bars include interventions that occurred if that mother was escalated to a hospital setting. It includes any interventions that occurred in that setting too. 
And you'll notice that hospitals only counted successful inductions, which means that my friend Donna's induction would not be one of the inductions noted in this statistic. So as you can see, attendance by professional midwives led to lower intervention rates across the board. So how do midwives manage to do that? Independent midwives are trained in assisting well birth, in preventing complications, and in administering life-saving treatments. A certified professional midwife, for example, must show competency at 780 skills, attend at various roles over 50 births, and successfully pass an eight-hour hands-on examination, all in order to qualify for the written exam. Midwives also spend more time with the mother. They intervene conservatively. And I think this is very important. Instead of organizing the mother's body around themselves, the way that obstetricians are trained to do, midwives organize themselves around the mother's body. So, so for example, you know, if a, if a mom, say, is up here, she's squatting, leaning on a partner or friend as the baby's head is showing, the midwife might very well be down here, you know, keeping an eye on the perineum, checking for cord prolapse, and so on. And midwives know how to screen and escalate their clients as needed to obstetrical care. So, about her second pregnancy, Donna says, I spent the first few months of the pregnancy respectfully asking countless obstetrical practices to permit me a trial of labor while inside I was agonizing, why is my labor on trial? After yet another OB practice scheduled her for a repeat cesarean, Donna turned to her husband and said, this baby is coming out of my vagina. I am not going to a hospital. We are having this baby at home. Are you trying to kill our son, he said. At their first meeting with their midwife, Donna's husband shifted in a way she'd never expected. He was going to trust her and trust the situation. So when the day came, Donna's son was born at home, without an epidural, without an induction, and without a repeat cesarean section. She told me, through a haze of hormones, joy, and exhaustion, I could hear my husband talking to me. You did it. I'm proud of you, he said. Donna's marriage experienced healing. So, let's zoom back out and look at the astonishing situation that we have here. We are spending a lot of money training very well-intended people to do unnecessary harm to mothers and babies, all the while thinking it is normal and for the good of everyone. And we have given this broken system a near monopoly. On the whole, obstetricians can be fantastic at what they do, which is handling high-risk surgical and emergency births. We need them, but thankfully, we don't need all births to be surgical. So we started with the question, why would we be paying so much for maternity care that's so expensive and yet performing so poorly at the same time? I think the answer is because we don't really know how badly it's doing and because we don't know about or have available to us other options. So that's what I'd like to see change. Being aware of and making available these other options, especially independent midwives, but also including other birth assistants, such as doulas, is key, I think, to unbreaking birth in the US. Independent midwives can work in homes and in midwife-led birthing centers, which also perform quite well. In fact, the National Birth Center Study 2 show that birthing centers also outperformed or equaled hospital, low-risk hospital births, and that their cesarean rate was 1 in 16 compared with our national 1 in 3. If even 10% of births last year had occurred in a birthing center, we would have saved over $1 billion. But this could only happen if Medicaid and every insurance company paid for midwifery services. We could even improve hospital birth by giving midwives independent admitting privileges so that they were not constrained to practice against the evidence. And that would give possibly the best of both worlds to women who want to give birth in a hospital or who have elevated risk factors. And did you know, by the way, that in many of the countries that are outperforming us, midwives actually train obstetricians in well birth? Imagine the possibilities if well birth was that well respected here. It will change. It will, it will take a change of that magnitude to unbreak birth in the US. So let's ask for that. 
a system in which independent midwives can practice legally in every state and in which, every, in which Medicaid and every insurance carrier cover their services is a system in which all women, regardless of wealth, can choose where and with whom to have their babies. And this might help protect other choices that are often very constrained in the hospital setting, such as whether or not to eat, what position to labor in, what interventions you have, and what happens to your baby after the birth. So to do this, we need every state to enact legislation that protects the right of midwives to practice legally. And we need insurance companies, we need every insurance company, including Medicaid, to cover their services. And that's where you come in. Because sadly, midwifery, independent midwives, cannot legally practice in almost half of US states, and it's exceedingly rare for an insurance company to cover their work. Now you may be thinking, that's all good, but I'm not gonna have kids, or I've already had mine. Well, look around you. Think about your friends, your daughters, your granddaughters. Think about the children you'll someday be friends with who haven't been born yet. There are a lot of steps to unbreaking birth in the US. I would like to ask you to start with just two. First, talk with your friends and your legislators. Second, find and join your local pro-midwifery organization. Sign a petition for them, write a letter for them, ask them what needs to be done. They'll know what needs to happen in your state. It's time, I think, and I hope, for us all to take action. Only together can we unbreak birth. Thank you very much.